All right, take it, RJ. Okie dokie. After that opening music, I was expecting I should be driving around in a souped up roadrunner chasing after dog smugglers in Van Nuys. I love it. <laughs> anyway, um, um, latest uh, uh, evolution hour. I'll start off with a really cheery note about uh, the fact that every one of us seems to be kind of muddling through the COVID panic. Uh, I was just up, went up to the store, uh, draining my <laughs> My finances down to the nub to pick up what was still remaining on the shelves. I figured I better get like another week or so of food stocked up. She was picking up stuff uh, for her 96 year old mom who was out in the car, staying out of the crowd <laughs> to do all of that. So everybody's kind of adapting. Fortunately, most of our governors uh, in the various states are kind of on the ball. The problem is we still got a slow curve on testing procedures and, and getting all the face masks and making sure first providers are, are uh, covered to make sure that they're not coming down with the stuff. And meanwhile, um, the Donnie come lately uh, at the federal level is uh, kind of getting on the ball, sort of, kind of. And anyway, so we'll, we'll muddle through on this despite them uh, and uh, see where we are going on stuff. Anyway, I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in due course. But as you all know, Contested Bones, Rupi and Sanford's anti-evolution book, we're into the home stretch on this. They've been going on now in a section of chapters for what they pompously refer to as our alternative framework for understanding human diversity, our alternative framework for understanding ape diversity, our alternative framework for understanding the human dispersion which basically boils down to repeating the claims that they've been making that I've been covering in previous episodes, why uh, they doubt that particular fossils mean anything for evolution. But they're really shy about what their ball is that they're bringing to the table. Uh, so they have, um, now have just referenced to an out of the Middle East model of dispersal. But the problem is that they've been citing in a couple new sources and one that was available all open uh, access, uh, so I put that up, it's uh, De Giorgio's uh, Explaining Worldwide Patterns of Human Genetic Variation Using a Coalescent-Based Serial Founder Model of Migration Outward from Africa. And it had made the mistake of referring to an instantaneous speciation model, by which they don't mean instantaneous like poof, but nevertheless, it was one of the various alternatives that were testing with the branching things, and you can look up the paper because all PNAS is open access. And uh, it, they're still talking about hundreds of thousands of year time frame for hominids and tens of thousands of years ago for some of these model coalescence. And by the way, they didn't think the instantaneous model uh, fit the facts as well as others. So in every possible respect, why was Rupi thinking it was a good idea to bring this paper up? Uh, because it was yet more information that doesn't fit their not yet specified model because uh, what's so amazing about them is how they just won't get into chronology. If they want to present a young earth creation as model of human origins, fine, do it, go ahead, boop. But, but be honest about it, say what you think, and worse, deal with the data field. Because if you try to compress too much into too little time, you're gonna bump into the fact that the data field isn't fitting. And because they don't really present their model, they only present an anti-model, they can save themselves that, oh, we can't really explain this particular fossil and this distribution better than our opponents on the evolution side can. So that's uh, a part of the methodological screw up that uh, occurs over and over again. Uh, Jackson is not with us, maybe with us a little bit later on. He's doing the, the normal uh, doing work and activity thing that uh, although their college is already um, uh, shifting into uh, uh, doing stuff online and not having to attend physical classes and that. So, uh, and that's what's been happening with EWU and WSU and the various uh, colleges in uh, my neck of the woods that I've been observing. And lucky that I attended a really wonderful dinosaur lecture before the shit hit pan uh, out at EWU a couple weeks ago. Anyway, um, so if he, he may be able to show up or not, I would like to tell everybody that my full hard copy of the very thick Rocks Were There, volume one uh, arrived. So now I can actually see my own book. And uh, several times I've already made use of it 
in jousting with creation is because uh, 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 instead of having to pull up my PDF and stuff, I can just check my index boop, <laughs> and find the text uh, that I need to do to bring things up. Oh, oh Lisa says uh, she uh, finds it very interesting that why he sees missed the 90% when saying 90% of species appeared at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, the, the details of animal distribution, biogeography, both in living uh, animals and paleo uh, biogeography, the distribution of animals that we can see by the fossil data, which has varying levels of detail depending on what it is. You can uh, get into some remarkably detailed paleobiogeography of for a foraminifera, for example, because their little bitty bodies are raining down in gigantic quantities onto the seafloor. And so you can tell an awful lot about them. And there's been an enormous number of studies about that. And yes. that, oh, uh, uh, you were saying- Biogeography is fascinating. And yes, much like everything else, can't deal with it. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, oh, here's a, 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 if you want to um, keep an eye out, remember, um, Part of the source methods approach has to do with that number three part, which you encountered in reading the first chapter of the new book, uh, where we point out that you got that, oh, what do you think happened part? <laughs> That's the map of time thing. And biogeography would fit into that format that whenever you're reading a creationist or if you're watching a creationist in a debate or you're um, uh, looking at uh, various apologetics on this, look for what isn't showing up which is what happened and where within their own framework. And so you try to figure out what do they think the earth looked like at this stage when this animal was dying and was therefore not on the ark versus the ones that were speciating after the ark and what happened there and where are they and what's the land distribution and how long does it take this animal to get to here and why don't we find indications of and so forth and so on. You can see the enormous problems they would get into. So it's always important to be looking for why they're not discussing that, why they aren't conceptualizing that in their own frame. If they think they have a powerful argument, why wouldn't they be doing it? What would stop them? <laughs> they would be anxious um, to present it because they don't have a model. They don't have a model. Yeah, that's probably it. And this is true. Um, it, when you get farther down into the book, TD, you're going to have fun time because you're going to be seeing the absence of this going on with Kurt Wise and Todd Wood and Andrew Snelling and Tim Clary. And it's just a mess as to what doesn't show up there. And we'll also be bringing some of that stuff in in volume two, where we're discussing a bit more about the legendary size of the flood. There's a whole, <laughs> I suppose it's a disturbing thought to realize that we're only halfway through the Rocks Were There project, that this month, <laughs> this giant book was where we had to go, yeah. we better cut this off for the moment so we can have a publishable book because of its sheer volume. That shows you how much information is out there that needed to be pulled together to be able to deal with this stuff in proper source methods level. But I think it's worthwhile because this is just jolly fun uh, to get into. Um, I was jousting earlier with a bunch of climate science denialists. And uh, this is kind of a sneak preview that in the farther down the road, one of the projects that Jackson and I are gonna be doing is a work, uh, which he came up with a nice little title, everyone's uh, um, a part of it, everyone's uh, uh, into it. Um, in the, the, the conspiracy thinking mongering that, that thinks the whole disciplines have to be wrong because the pundit disagrees with them. So, you know, all the climate scientists have to be wrong or all the scientists have to be wrong on evolution because of the small group. So they get conspiracy mongering is kind of commonplace in that area. And climate science is one of those really fascinating ones. So I've been looking up material. I already had quite a chunk of stuff on climate science denialism, but now I'm gearing up to be able to, to look into some of the linchpins points so that we'll be covering in that project what the climate science denialists seem to think are their heavy guns. And it probably won't come as a shock that the same bad methods that you see in creationism, you're seeing on that side of things. And the same thing with anti-vaxxers or flat earthers or uh, uh, moon landing hoax never happened, uh, a belief uh, uh, that bit, uh, conspiracy thinking with the assassination groupies. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but the method's the same. And those source methods issues that we're bringing up as the standard model for creationism, ooh, you tippy type in there, TD? <laughs> Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, if you do that, put yourself on mute there uh, because some people have said, you know, yeah, yeah, that's uh, 
Uh, now we got uh, Lisa uh, says uh, that uh, not to mention using their model young earth creationists, there wouldn't be 600,000 people on earth, let alone Israel, which did not uh, it, it include the Exodus. So, oh, C. Brown, what do you know about the Schwartz and Tattersall paper? The question is, C. Brown, do you know anything about the Schwartz and Tattersall paper? And which Schwartz and Tattersall might that be? Are you under the impression there's just like one that Schwartz uh, and uh, Tattersall have never done anything other than just the paper? Uh, C. Brown, I'm still waiting for you to, to uh, make good on the bit that I asked you to do where you, you should contact the various scientists on a cosmic ray a penetration and the formation of a carbon 14 in atoms from nitrogen. And you tell them with your careful analysis why they're wrong and get back to us on it before you post any time on my channel in the comment section. And so far you have not done that. So that's why if you're wondering why I've been deleting your comments that you're popping out where you're repeating the same claptrap over and over again, that's why. Because okay, I, I'm going to mute and uh, look this up because he says this paper bas basically says that if we want to be objective, we really need to scrap the iconic list of hominid fossils. Yeah, well, it's it all depends on what they mean by the, the, the bits. Uh, the situation that I'm aware of, and you also want to check about the date. Uh, if some of this is going on in, you know, when they're just beginning to get a grip on uh, the new Homo erectus finds, because there's there's a, a legitimate discussion as to how many sub-branches of Homo erectus there are, uh, and uh, Heidelbergensis and uh, all the other Rudolfensis that um, broadens the field of things, and they're, they're routinely shown in charts. So that's another matter that you really want to be paying attention to, which of course C. Brown doesn't because he's a credulous creationist, is the chronology of when things are. Science builds on the work. So just because somebody said a particular thing in 1995 or 2005 or 2010, well, look what happened later. And let's see how it's being used, how it's fitting in, who's building off of what, what knowledge are they doing? The situation is fundamentally this that we've got a, a variety of australopithecines that are bipedal hominids going back a few million years, that there's a period in which you start seeing the very earliest, not really australopithecines anymore, or hyper advanced australopithecines that got labeled under the Homo habilis uh, tag. There are relatively few fossils involved, relatively few to be able to work with, relatively few fairly complete skeletons to operate off of. So that obviously limits your ability to work out exactly who's related to who in a, in a, a lineage sense, even though if you look at a particular organism, what would um, a hominid transitional ape man look like? Um, and do any of these look too far out of the range? No. So it's a matter of which one is which, or maybe it's even one that we haven't found yet because it didn't get preserved. <coughs> Eventually, that habilis cloud starts settling in and you start seeing a more standard Homo erectus cluster with branchings off of there. And, and there's very little uh, concern at the moment uh, that uh, Homo neanderthalensis is branching off probably six, 700,000 years ago presumably before the earliest fossils are known and persists for the next half a million years, all the way down uh, into um, uh, the later period when their populations are starting to break down. Uh, it's still during the late ice age period and they're uh, then starting to bump in and having some interbreeding boinking going on. Uh, uh, Lisa, uh, for truth, uh, James Downard asked, uh, she asked, uh, uh, James, are Denisovans uh, technically erectus? Um, it's a curious bit. Uh, I think they've started to get some, um, uh, well, I think they are actually regarded as a separate um, 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 species designation because they're, they're far enough apart. We don't have a huge amount of fossil material on them, although it's, it's getting more. I think they've got more skull material now. But the point is we've got some DNA from them and it's in the same time frame, at least for some of these finds that co uh, are the ones where Neanderthals are interbreeding. And uh, I think the, uh, some of the papers that I've been posting in previous episodes uh, relate to that, to where they're able to, to draw an awful lot on that. But it's at the very least we can say that Denisovans aren't homo sapiens. And there's some interbreeding going. There's still a mystery third group. that We've never found any fossils yet. The only clue are some genetic things that are not in the Homo uh, um, uh, neanderthalensis bunch, and they're not in the Denisovan bunch. They've got these little retrogressed groups that suggest there's a third bunch of, uh, of uh, early Homo knocking around out there 
that's shown up in a little trace of our genes that we don't yet have a, a, a physical candidate for it. So there we go. Um, it's always, uh, C, C. Brown is a beautiful illustration of what happens when somebody is an overconfident copier of other people's views without understanding them. And we found, uh, um, Erica had a wonderful debate with Bill Morgan uh, last week. Uh, 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 Bill Morgan is a young earth creationist and somebody who is just willfully happy to be ignorant because he is constantly being asked to look into stuff and he was frequently telling, including Dapper Dino, uh, that, oh, I'll look into that. And then it turns out, no, he doesn't. And he's perfectly happy to not know about stuff. I asked him some questions uh, in the live feed that got uh, into uh, the discussion where I wanted to know, did he know anything about therapsids? Nah. And was he terribly curious about that? Nah. And could he figure out like what barriments and stuff are? Yeah, no. So um, here's somebody who, who is far behind the curve, even on the creationism angle. Be proud of your silliness and at least read their stuff and know what the hell they're arguing and recognizing where they're bumping into uh, the brick walls or not. C. Brown is an example of just a secondary parasite. And so he's a slight notch above a Bill Morgan, oddly enough, because Bill Morgan shows no sign of reading much of anything. He just repeats the tropes and that's about as far as it goes and no curiosity. Whereas C. Brown does scavenge through the creationist literature. <coughs> he bought um, the book, um, uh, the Contested Bones book and apparently has been scavenging bits and bits and bits out of the stuff. But that's about as far as it goes. And every time I've tried to engage um, C. Brown on the uh, particulars of things and to get him to apply and clarify what the hell he thinks is going on, turns into a fog bank because all he's functionally doing <clears throat> is repeating the tropes of the creationists. If you, the moment you let somebody else think for it, you got a problem. It doesn't mean you don't pay attention to um, um, serious work and, and uh, try to understand it. <clears throat> now, let me get my little sweet tea here. Yeah, Brian Stevens posted the link to the paper we think C. Brown citing. I'll yeah. see it. C. Brown is I, I don't insane. have my reference space up. I would, I would be um, likely to find that it was also cited in um, um, Rupi and Sanford. That's one of the reasons why I built a spreadsheet and an analysis of it. In and fact, he seems of, to have left. Ah, uh, well, oh, yeah. I'm surprised. Nine people watching. Grace nine Rob months. and ran yeah. away. <laughs> he ran his way as soon as we asked him what his source yeah, was. Yeah, well, and, and, like, um, Everyone, uh, uh, Lisa was talking about an example of where she was um, jousting with a, a nutball over um, a, a particular thing about, I think, uh, fake human migrations of the past and so forth that were wrong. And the thing is that uh, she's applying source methods, which is she had a source for her argument and was willing to post it. And when she asked for their source, suddenly crickets. And that's a dead giveaway. Yeah, and you can go around and around the mulberry bush. Uh, um, uh, um, TD, if you've been following my uh, Twitter joust with the various climate denialists uh, of late, you'll be seeing me. Try. I helped found, find sources for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and you'll notice exactly the same method is going on it, that they have tropes. They got pictures of stuff. They've got sources, secondary sources that they've relied on. But what they haven't done is fact check them. And they don't do that, or they don't read the primary source science literature that's being criticized. This um, I bring up uh, Noah Diffenbaugh. Um, uh, this is I'll type his little name in here. <laughs> Noah Diffenbaugh is a climate scientist, and I uh, attended a lecture that he had at Gonzaga University last year, and I think maybe a year before last. I think it was just last year, and. Um, Excellent. And almost all of the material that he has uh, up um, at PNAS and uh, Nature and all the rest are open access papers. So you'll be, everybody can download and read them anytime they want. And um, uh, I've been using uh, the 2015 paper that he uh, uh, did on the um, uh, drought cycle in California, because what they had worked out that California has had droughts uh, all, all the time. They go through cycles on them because you know, the problem is that the drought cycle we're seeing now is not natural. It doesn't fit 
the pattern of what we've been seeing in previous ones, because now we've got a cycle where the high temperatures are coinciding with the drought, and that's producing the super fire seasons that we're seeing. And it's, it's atypical, it's just out of sync with the stuff that they were seeing from all that previous stuff. Uh, oh, Lisa says um, it was Nazareth. Uh, it didn't exist at the time, supposed time of Jesus, and he brought up the Pilate Stone. Yeah, there's a, a cottage industry of we got to find evidence for Jesus. And uh, in part because there ain't a hell of a lot of evidence uh, uh, for it. And so there, there's a tremendous urge to find uh, the tomb, the, uh, the document, the confirmation, not only for the Jesus period, but earlier in the Davidic kingdom. Uh, and of course, then the Exodus times, that's another one. And boy, there's a, just a bunch of ones that they just really want it to be true. Uh, a, a thing that just popped up recently that uh, in the egg on the face category, the, the, the museum of the Bible that was um, uh, founded by, uh, I think maybe it was the, the bunch that runs the Hobby Lobby, um, uh, underwrote it. Anyway, they bought a whole bunch of uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And there were a bunch of scholars saying, better check these and it turned National Geographic that it just did a thing on it where apparently all of them were frauds. <laughs> they had just shelled out a bunch of money for 100% failure rate uh, of frauds on there and uh, it, the, it, it, it's part of this need to have that confirmation bias on there and just instead of just letting the chips fall where they may and try to make sense out of what you got with the data field. Um, oh, C. Brown. Uh, um, oh, I like this. This speaks to the fossils that we see in the supposed fossil record. LOL, LOL. Yeah. Uh, anytime you want to discuss the reptile mammal transition, by all means, do your monograph on that. Explain why God made probanognathids to match evolution. That, to my mind, means that the God that made those things loves us evolutionists. He adores Robert Broom. He absolutely falls over himself to coddle. Ooh, I want to make a Neil Shubin and all the rest of these people happy. So I'm going to make fossil after fossil after fossil after fossil after fossil after fossil after fossil. After fossil. Uh, that just fits their paradigms. That's got cartilage that's in just the right spot with the middle ear bones and all these things are absolutely wonderful. So but thank RJ, you very much, Fossil but RJ. Yeah. Design. Uh, another thing C. Brown brought up, uh, something from Bernard Wood, uh, there's more diversity among chimps than humans. All I have to say to that is, so what? So what? Yeah. <laughs> Big deal. Humans yeah, went through a population nice. bottleneck of 10,000. We've 000, only got two species of, of pan, ago. and even there, there's a remarkable amount of variation because the bonobos are so distinctive from the, uh, the standard pan. Um, the fossil record's just crappy because they happen to live in an environment that's just dead, just perfect to not preserve stuff. The bones just dissolve in those forested environments. So they, they, you, you can't have much. Now we have a bit better on some other primate groups. And I'm always intrigued at the fact that, that um, the, the chimpanzee species are probably as, as old, if not older than we are. And the orangutan species is about the same age as we are. So speciation was going on with orangutans, I think about 300,000 years ago and around the same time we were doing it. So, so we're, we're all comparably new kids on the block compared to um, millions of year time frame and compared to even longer. But I, I don't expect C. Brown ever uh, to uh, get involved. Uh, C. Brown, fossil record is not supporting the fossil record. I know you believe that and I'm sure you'll believe it down to your dying day. But do not be amazed when people who do know the fossil record just go uh, and are not convinced by you because you know in the same way that somebody who wants to insist the civil war didn't happen, don't be surprised if people who know the civil war happened are gonna say uh, no. Uh, so there is the problem. And anytime you wanna write your little monograph and send it off and, and explain to all those paleontologists why you know their field better than they do, uh, let us know uh, somewhere how that turns out. So. Uh, there are lots and of he, intermediates. And he immediately Brown. asks where the term, intermediates are after you talk about intermediates, like pragnifids. Yeah. And I'll tell you one thing. This is one of those diagnostics. Let me be clear and concise. All anti-evolutionists fail to conceptualize what an intermediate would look like that they would accept. 100% failure rate. If anybody knows of any, creationist or anti-evolutionist of any stripe whatsoever who has ever specified other than 
the, the, the weird chimera stuff, you know, crocodile crap and all that sort of that, that, but nevertheless actually lays out what the criteria of a true transitional would look like. I have done this question with an, intelligent designers a lot, including Jonathan Wells on bird evolution, where when I asked him point blank, okay, you got Archaeopteryx, which you say is not a transitional, tell me what a perfect transitional would look like and tell me how I can tell the difference between that and Archaeopteryx. And whoop, he couldn't figure that out. He's never thought about it. No anti-evolutionist thinks this through. And it, it's a simple reason why. If they did, they would have to admit that there are transitionals in the fossil record. Now, by the way, Nathaniel Jensen, you, uh, C. Brown, you better contact Nathaniel Jensen because he, creationist, has just done a posting just a couple of years ago where he says, oh, creationists have always accepted transitional forms. We always have agreed that there were transitional forms, which of course you're going, but nevertheless, um, um, the goalposts are being moved. How many creationists will actually be following uh, uh, Jensen in that goalpost moving? Um, I think you can hear this squeaky sound as the wheels are being moved. <laughs> I, I hear the sound of scraping as the poles um, just pushed over the ground, desperately oh, trying Brown, to move it I, even I, I further back. I love I, C. Brown is hilarious here. What environments pressure push the evolution of stupid chimp-like creatures to intelligent spaceship building humans? Uh, um, do you want to have a like a, a multi-year seminar on the details of all of that stuff? I'm supposed to tell you that in like five minutes when you are too lazy to read any of the science work yourself. Am I supposed to do all of your thinking for you? You won't even do any thinking for you. So this is something that's just absolutely hilarious. What you've got, um, uh, the, first of all, the chimpanzee is living in a fixed environment. The interesting bit about the selection pressure issue has to do in part with the fact that the environment that the Australopithecines were in was changing more rapidly than others. And it was shifting away from a forest environment into that savanna mode. And so there is an issue of changing adaptability. Plus the ancestors of the hominids were bipedal in a way that the ancestors of the chimpanzees weren't. So there was an adaptive niche going up. Then there's a whole slew of other factors, even down to what kind of color receptors that you develop as to whether or not you're seeing fruits or not. I've heard no pressure uh, that could do that. Food, food uh, um, uh, elements, a jaw structure in terms of uh, dietary elements. And this process didn't happen instantaneously. It took place over millions of years. It's slow, 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 slow. But of course, you don't get any of that. Oh, tornado. Oh, you're a bit late. <laughs> Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Yes, we're almost uh, to the Patreon. Thank. Oh yes, when I when I get to thank people and also uh, uh, deal with that. But C Brown is is very useful. Um, uh, C Brown Jensen never said there is no transitions from chimp to humans, and C Brown has double negative uh, backwards run sentences. Yoda speak down. Okay, um, uh, but the thing is that that uh, there are an awful lot of C Browns in the world. These are people who are uh, ready with tropes who have never thought through their own model at all, and you will never be able to get them to think through their own model. Their entire argument is a negative one. Evolutionists supposedly can't explain X. It's up to us to have to work out all of the data field. And then when we present the argument, then they go, no, that's not true. We refuse to believe that. That's wrong. Boom. Give them the middle finger. Uh, and that's how it works. Whereas, excuse me, you need to make an argument. The creationists need to make a positive argument. This is the whole point that I've been making about one of the reasons why Rupi and Sanford have their head up their ass is because they don't have a model. They have a cartoon version of a promise of a model. They do not in fact have a model. We have no clue when they think any of this stuff is happening. Whereas if you look at the standard models, you're seeing chronology listings where they are pinning themselves down. They are talking about what fossil data exists and what they think is happening before and what they think is happening next. There's a huge technical literature on every possible component and element that's involved from the genes to the selection pressure and the development of tool making and the origin of fire and how we're using in that element and the development of cooking and what interaction that does with our dietary system. We allude to some of that, by the way, in the, the volume one of the new book. Uh, we're gonna be having more on human evolution in volume two. Uh, it's wonderfully fascinating subject matter. And as we unfortunately demonstrate in the science department, 
that when you pull together so much of the relevant information, you get a thick book uh, because there's so much out there. Whereas look at the difference with contested bones. So just, just from a sheer physical element of it, the difference between our two books for, for volume size. And there's a book where contested bones has no index, no references. I have to compile all that by myself. They don't want you to find information very well. They've cited about 500 sources all told in the book. We've got 4,000 in ours. Um, am I supposed to be impressed by this? No, no. And anybody who wants to be impressed by our book should be able to look at it directly. And they should be able to look out what they say. They look up the source material and all that, the rest. Anyway. That, that way would be useful for um, cleaning up a uh, spill of coffee, let alone. Yeah. Oh, and now let me get uh, and thank uh, my people on the uh, patrons uh, here. Uh, oh, Elisa for Truth says, uh, 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 in all fairness, C. Brown wouldn't understand the science. That's a last true because he has not demonstrated that he is capable of, of delving into and looking into the terminology. Anyway, on the patron front, I'm going to be not self-serving here and, and say to everybody that I am well aware of the fact that we are in a COVID crisis and an awful lot of people are being laid off and they're in work situations where they're not sure where they're gonna be able to pay bills for stuff they have no way to get around. Income tax is coming up in April, even though there's gonna be a bit of delay on paying. People have got uh, uh, insurance, car insurance, house insurance, health bills, medicine, uh, all the kinds of things they have to deal with. And suddenly a ton of people don't have assurance as to whether or not they're gonna have a job or whether they're gonna be able to get some emergency money to cover over it. So I am well aware of the fact that if there are people that may be helping out patron where they may look at the money that they're given to the old RJ in Spokane and go, I can't really take that um, this month. And um, they may have to, to bail out on it. And I fully understand that so far, there has been none of that in patron and I am uber grateful for everybody that stuck up on it, but but as as much as I don't want anybody to stop uh, supporting the project, I say put me below all of the important issues that you need to keep yourself safe and to keep your family and situation going normally. So put me low on the triage list, even though I don't want you to uh, uh, stop doing that. So uh, let me thank our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric and Speed of Sound and Suris and Zeshi, uh, and uh, then our researcher levels, Travis and Convert and Eat and James and History Miner and Ralph and Paul Ogia, whose name I always, Paul, Paul, Paul oh, no, no, it is, it is yeah. Paul Ogia. I'm always Ogia. mangling it, I'm so sorry. It, it's Paul Ogia now. Uh, I know. For, for, uh, and then our Patty assistant said. researchers, Mike Apple and Ian Chan and Duranku and Ben Simpson and uh, Todes Real and our friends, Daniel and Steve Bauman, geology. Uh, Marigale Beddoes and Insects Cool and Devin Reeves and Morton Nielsen and Paul the Skeptic and Puffalopagus and Bo Rasmussen and Staggles and Alex and Paul and still legacy patrons who in their own times have had to have financial issues where they've had to uh, stop helping out but I never will not thank you Jan and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Nanya and Sun and Ugly Joel and Trulds and Everett and Sur, uh, every one of you who has helped in any way, shape or form at any time, I'm extremely grateful and I will always be so. So that's that part. Now, um, for the second part of the show, it's um, uh, more James Cole, Oh, dear sweet James Cole, the gift that keeps on giving, along with Denise O'Leary, the Canadian intelligent design person. James Cole is a cornucopia. He's mentioned briefly in the new book, uh, and he wrote a snotty review up on Amazon. He was the very first person to review the book. Sorry for being the... late, guys. I had my microphone muted. Oh, well. Yeah. And he, he gave a, uh, uh, a one-star review on it, but Cole never keeps on uh, um, expanding the limit of how off the wall he can be because guess what he did? He decided to try to, to prove that there's some problem with the evolution of smell by citing a Harun Yaya post. <laughs> so there we've got our younger creationist Christian now relying like Kent Hovind has uh, on that wackaloon uh, industrial strength stupid uh, Islamic anti-evolutionist Harun Yaya, uh, AKA uh, Adrian Aknar. And uh, we, by the way, we got a little bit of a discussion of him along the way in the New Rocks book. I put the link up to a paper 
that um, uh, Cole mistakenly linked to as well as that. He can't, he doesn't realize when he should quit when he's behind. Because after linking to this bit on the Harun Yahya, he decided to show, he says, explain how therapsids evolved outside the context of the space-time continuum of visual perception. And I'm going, what? And what he linked to, and I put the link up to the paper from Zhao 2018, it's about how olfaction uh, can alter an, an organism's perception of time in a, in a micro sense. It can kind of get lose track of, of things because of the overwhelming element of, of the sensory uh, overload. This has nothing to do with the evolution of therapsids or even for that matter, the evolution of smell. And then I put a bunch of links to a bunch of technical papers which go into the actual science work on how they have been working out the evolution of olfaction, uh, not only in vertebrates, as in fish in, and in insects, and even a paleo reconstruction of Neanderthal sex pheromone perception. <laughs> Bow chicka wow wow. Damper 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 here. Neanderthal Giggity. shows up with, with pizza box. And <laughs> yeah, um, after submerging yourself in coal, take a uh, day long bath in sulfuric acid to cleanse yourself. Yeah, well, the, I, I, I alluded to a, a reference. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Chief Tech Detective, which is Neil Simon's follow up of um, uh, his parody of mystery stories, uh, The uh, uh, Murder by Death, and he did a sequel where he basically had every Humphrey Bogart movie ever and Alan, uh, 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 um, uh, yipes, uh, suddenly forgot the name of the guy that plays um, uh, the Humphrey Bogart character in there. And uh, he does a, a hilarious bit. Anyway, it's, it's a, 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 a riotously, for me, a riotously funny uh, parody. And there is uh, Dom DeLuise plays uh, Pepe Damascus who is riffing off of the, uh, um, a character that, oh, um, uh, well, yipes, I'm, I'm getting brain farts here, um, oh, um, from the Maltese Falcon, uh, Peter Lorre uh, played. And uh, 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 Damascus says that I'm oily and greasy and wear cheap perfume. It'll, it'll clean off if you bathe in turpentine. <laughs> and so anyway, um, in in that, our news, all, all mods, please do jump on the uh, timeout C wag uh, C brown wagon. Um, yeah, as... yeah. It's um, uh, yeah, the he, problem he, is he, he will never learn. Uh, the, what you get from a C brown, and this is true of anybody that operates like that, is that's all you're ever going to get. Uh, that it's an around and around and around the mulberry bush, and it's fruitless because they never get to anywhere. I don't have to worry about the C browns of the world. I've repeatedly told him. Why are you worrying about me? I'm just a little YouTuber in Spokane, Washington. You should take your genius, write your monograph, submit it to the scientists, persuade them. The same thing goes for the climate denialist. You know, I said, why are you bothering on Twitter? This is not the audience you need to worry about. You need to persuade the climatologist that you're right, not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, take, take, take a shit and go publish it in uh, peer-reviewed journals. See yeah. how it goes. And, and you'll see how it goes. This one particular guy, um, um, there, I'll, I'll do a, um, a future episode on it because uh, it, it, it's too beautiful an example of stupid. Uh, but he's a guy, uh, Ned um, uh, no Novikolov, I think. And he's done uh, just like one or two little papers, one of which they printed under false pretensions where they reversed their names to submit it, <laughs> which is just weird. Anyway. Um, and, and they're basically arguing that somehow it's just the solar cycles that are doing things that CO2 literally has no effect on climate. That's their what? argument. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, that, they, that, that was actually perfect, Tornado. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> the what? And here, here's where it gets really amusing. Because um, in this paper, one of the people that was jousting back and forth that was defending the climate science pointed out that a chart in this guy's paper uh, happened to be drawing off of a uh, temperature gradients for lunar temperatures at the surface. And the guy flatly said that this uh, uh, climate uh, skeptic, uh, the, ch the chart he put up was wrong. The numbers were wrong. And he was just having conniption fits about this. And it was like pulling teeth to try to find out what the primary source material was, except the people defending climate science were happy to link to the papers. So gradually I built up the material and I, and I located the, the paper that this guy had written, uh, Ned, 
uh, the climate denialist, and located the, the chart in question and found that it did match up with the one that was being posted as, as saying that this was wrong. And then, because I had the original, I was now able to look at the source citations underneath it, where the Ned guy had cited. And I was able to get those papers. So I downloaded all those papers and discovered that what the guy had done was mis misunderstand the curve for subsurface temperature as the curve for surface temperature on the moon. Oh my God. He put the wrong numbers in. And so he was doing a global average based on the wrong number. Now, oh here's my where God. Got fun. Oh, it gets even better. He was doing a global average based on the wrong number on a body that did not have an atmosphere, an atmosphere. <laughs> and more importantly, does not have a fucking greenhouse effect. Yeah, on top of so, but, but the again, point is that asked, he, he, he was screwed. The thing was that when we pointed this out, that I directly saw the primary source information that showed that he had misunderstood the primary data. He then immediately said, well, I don't cite that 1999 paper. It's the one that you got in your caption. <laughs> uh, oh, that's honesty. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> so. And so, again, what we were getting, we were getting with Ned, what we're getting with with uh, James Cole, which is this incredible runaround. Admittedly, uh, nobody can ma match Cole for just gibberish jargon. If you want, if if you want to see what Cole is like on steroids. Just go when you're buying my book, <laughs> Jackson and R's book. Uh, when you're doing that, go and read the reviews and find the one by James Cole because he goes on for like a two pages of typical Cole rant. It's just jargon-laden gibberish about light and pheromones and and so and so blah blah. blah. It, it's just dribble, and uh, that's pretty much you get with from him all the time. <laughs> and the papers don't match up with what he insists they do. It's it's just amazing. And the same thing with this. Ned guy. And what was interesting are all of his followers, and he's got a bunch of them circulating around, including one guy who I think is a crypto Nazi. I mean, the storm signal guy. Anyway, Ooh. yeah. Uh, he, uh, the, the acronyms to SS. Uh, anyway, he um, and others are constantly praising this guy and liking this guy and retweeting this guy, but you can't ever get him to look at the primary source information. So I've been waving the Diffenbaugh paper at him from, from uh, 2015. And, and asking, uh, well, where does that come from? Well, how do you account for that data? And then they were, and now they're jumping on a source that they found that criticized one of Diffenbaugh's paper. And of course that must be an Oracle and true. Well, did you read the original papers to check? Have you fact checked any of this stuff? It's, it's, it's the same fog bank all the time. <laughs> bad methods yield bad results, duh. Ah, well. it's, it's like my creationist uh, sites that unfossilized, um, Hadrosaur from Alaska that um, is that that um, is entirely due to the poor wording in the original article. Oh yeah, criticism came and they said no, the, these are fossilized; they're just not permeabilized. Which what you yeah, mean, they, like, and that's why um, uh, nobody oh. who is a rigorous scholar should be shy about offering their source material. Anybody that is relying on a secondary source, it's not necessarily that the secondary source will be invalid, but be honest about it and cite it. But but uh, um, both Tornado and TD know full bore, and I'm sure Scientist Mel has encountered this with various people that you've interacted with as well, that when you press them for where are you getting this from, they just go into silent running, that it's like pulling teeth to even tell them where, find out where they're getting the material from. Sometimes it's because they don't remember. And other times I think they know- Well, I got one of them to tell good. me where they got their material from. They were a dude by the name of Lemonbird. And this was shortly after you left that sort of mm. chat, RJ. The person named Lemonbird said that radiometric dating doesn't work. And you know what? I pressed him for a source and well, it didn't take much pressing because he said, oh, my source is Kent Hoven. <laughs> ah! Oh, my God. Mark off your little, get out. You know what we should do as a product? We should mark like a, a, a creationist bingo card <laughs> thing that we could sell as things that people could be using. We could get a little yeah, bit off of that. Yeah, if you want to deal with Kent Hoven's arguments, and if you want to know everything about Kent Hoven, watch How Creationism Taught Me Real Science and watch the Kent Fence.
Yeah, and I've Dapper debated Dino's it. Channel. And uh, and Jackson has bumped into him, and Dapper Dino has bumped into him. There's a whole bunch of people that have taken on him, and Bill Ludlow and others, late Bill Ludlow. Uh, we um, uh, have some uh, uh, allusions to Kent in the rocks were there. We can't do a, a book criticizing creationism without having a little bit on Kent Hovind. Oh yeah, I, I've seen I've seen the bits and pieces in Kent Hovind, just laughing at him. Spe speaking of Kent Hovind, um, Kent with Bent uh, XX yesterday. Uh, had to only read on. It was great. But um, Colin Patterson came up in Kent's lecture. Ah. Oh, dear. And you know about Colin Patterson because you've been yeah, reading I Evolution have Slam, Dunk. Slam Dunk. And I just looked <laughs> back and, and in chat, I said, yeah, okay, it's Colin Patterson who had chronic foot in the mouth syndrome. Is it fair for me to say that 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 you understand the Colin Patterson affair better because you have read uh, my discussion of it in Slam Dunk? Very, very. I mean, I still have to go refer back to it, just to yeah. Sort of I, 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 I made it a point, and this is another advantage of source methods. This is that there's a reason why we're doing the things we do and selecting the information that we're doing, because we know what gets used as a trope. So that's why I made a point of discussing Colin Patterson because he gets troped a lot, as you just found out, and so I wanted to make sure. That no, you've got that covered. Uh, um, Christine Janice particularly liked my section on uh, uh, that too, because she had actually met, she interacted with Colin Patterson and she knew just how oddly obtuse he was. And so it was nice to find that same thing happening over yeah, uh, it, my it's neck like of the woods. Colin, Colin Patterson was this wacky little um, person on the fringe of cladistics right at the time where punctuated equilibrium was coming about and ruining yep. everything we knew. Um, he had a problem. See, one of the things about the super rigid form of Claytism uh, that uh, was a problem is in principle, they just can't stand the idea that anything is identified as a direct relative of anything else. Everything is like a sister group. And that they've kind of gotten used to that element, but in, in the extreme form of Claytism that was just dig in your heels, nothing can ever be identified as anything related to anything. And that's why uh, Michael Denton latched on to that brand of cladism uh, as a particular model. That's why he thought back in the 1980s, oh, the evolutionists are adopting cladism, which is actually refuting evolution. He just didn't understand. No, 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 that's not actually the case. Yeah, no, that's an extreme end of cladism. If you look at everything else, oh, hey, and Most one of, of his colleagues, I think just recently that. died, uh, one of the uh, um, um, transformed cladists as well. Uh, and it's not that they were incompetent scientists, but they had a particularly narrow way of looking at it. And what, what was intriguing, and, and uh, I, I discussed that in Slam Dunk, uh, how uh, even his last book that he wrote was oddly equivocally worded and kind of behind the curve on a lot of these things. He was still not up on a lot of the newer transitional fossils. Yeah, it, he, it, in my opinion, he seems to have been getting left behind by a science. Yeah. A bit like Richard Dawkins, actually. Well, and a few others, Alan Fiducia and others, but yeah, Dawkins, we have to remember that Dawkins is a zoologist, not a paleontologist. And it's not that he was oblivious to it, but if you're not keeping up with the field, um, you can get into some troubles on there. If you, uh, I think n not to be dumping too much on poor Richard, uh, but I think in between him and somebody who was a paleontologist like Stephen Jay Gould, and Gould was just an anal retentive data geek compared to Richard Dawkins. And all you have to do is just compare their writings. Uh, you compare uh, the typical Dawkins book, even in the technical era, the extended phenotype and that material, you contrast that with what footnote heavy, analytical heavy, uh, digression heavy uh, stuff that um, uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould was doing. And it, it, is, it is quite a contrast. And so I, I sometimes get into, into uh, uh, gentle fisticuffs with Jackson because he is somebody who grew up much more uh, reading into the Richard Dawkins work, in particular, a lot of the more recent books, Ancestor's Tale and things like that. And nothing wrong with those books. 
But the thing is, is that I, I came from that Stephen Jay Gould environment way earlier in the 1970s and 80s. And so I'm bumping into a lot of the things that were the fist fights that were going on between Dawkins and Gould that have settled down because Dawkins uh, is the survivor and Gould has been dead for almost 20 years. And so it's kind of cooled off. And I'm more familiar with some of the hot button items on that. And the Patterson case is an example of it. But the fact that, that anybody that wants to be up to speed on all of these issues, uh, it's really important to have all that pulled together. And I wanted to have it so that you didn't have to necessarily have to spend a week plowing through Google searches to try to track down where a lot of this information is that you can be sped up by finding out what the skivvy is and then using your Google time to move beyond that to get even farther ahead of the game. And that's what I want everybody to be able to do is to get a farther ahead of the game. Uh, that there's no excuse in 2020 that everybody can't do what I do in the sense that not that I can, they can devote 24 hours a day to it uh, and, and because I'm a retiree, but that I'm saying that, that the accessibility of the primary source material is literally only a mouse click download away. And therefore we can make use of that fabulous power and the ability to, to interconnect in a very powerful way to where what one person doesn't know, somebody else will know, and you can speed up the process. You wanna share that knowledge so that everybody can move faster and interconnect better and coordinate better. And that blob of proficiency is gonna slam into the little teeny unsuspecting creationist who has no clue how far behind they are on the data curve. And we wanna show them how far behind they are on the data curve. Got it? <laughs> now, of course, RJ, you mentioned not being able to do it 24-7, but the recent health situation, I argue that's not so true anymore. Uh, actually, that, that is a relevant point, uh, that at least for a while, people will have some uh, time to read on their hands. And so if anybody wants, no matter how long the COVID crisis goes, I can assure you this will occupy a big chunk of your attention. <laughs> So, hey, the COVID crisis just gives you an excuse to buy RJ's damn book. Yeah, yeah. And for those who haven't seen it, uh, uh, Jackson and I just did a little uh, a blurb, a little video um, um, advert for it. Uh, Pologia, Pologia, however you want to pronounce it, uh, will be doing a, a piece on us probably in the next few weeks or so. He had another thing that he had to end up, but we both recorded some stuff on. It's a criticism of a bunch of stupid geology uh, from uh, Creation Ministries, I think. And um, uh, we have our little talking heads, my little geeky head, and the much less geeky head of, of Jackson uh, that will be doing all of that. And then um, we'll see also, uh, PZ Myers has the book. <coughs> uh, mentioned it briefly in his thing. I, he hasn't gotten into reading it yet. Hopefully- Tony Reed has does. it. <coughs> Hopefully when he does, he will have some nice, interesting things to say about it because I pointed out to him several examples of things that are right up his alley as a biologist. Uh, the Lenski uh, material, the stuff on orphan genes, uh, the, the uh, chromosome two stuff, uh, all of that, that, that I think we've done a commendable job in pulling together a range of technical literature on uh, Jensen and Sanford and Carter and all the rest that's pretty damned ahead of the curve on this. I think a lot of people will be surprised at just how much there is and how, when it's marshaled together, how powerful it can be. So there we go. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Reed complimented your uh, Ian Jackson's work uh, yesterday, um, and he has the book too. So yeah, that's one of your one of your physical copies. Yeah, and we uh, um, uh, both uh, the eBooks and the uh, paperbacks have been selling, and uh, we'll see how long that uh, continues as more and more people find out about it because it's meant to be used as a resource so that it's uh, carefully indexed so you can find information in it. And it's got lots of up-to-date charts and stuff on things that uh, we're delighted with how up-to-date we are on those things from the uh, material on the uh, Cambrian explosion, the, the various phyla uh, in the appendix, uh, the stuff on um, uh, the feathered theropods, um, all the different listings of, of things, even just a compendium of all the papers that uh, Lenski's team has done on their long-term experiment. You, you might not realize how much work it's been. It's like 60 papers over the last 20 years and uh, all of it's coordinated. And you can see how little of it gets discussed by the anti-evolutionists in that section. I think that's in chapter four, somewhere down the line in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, they don't, they don't like uh, primary source uh, stuff. 
They like selected primary source. And that's the other factor is that, that um, when somebody uh, brings up a technical paper and they're a creationist, my scholarly methods antenna start quivering because I'm wondering, did they find this out on their own clever research or have they copied it from an apologetic website and they're not telling you? Well, I can check my data field and see if it's got a little black box next to that paper. And that means it's been cited by anti-evolutionists. And most of the time there's a black box, which means they're not getting that material cold. They're getting it because they're copying it from a secondary website, but they don't want to tell you that because that will probably sound like what they are, which is a parasitical copyist. But that's stenography, that's not research. Another way, another way you can do it, they don't give a source, uh, but they, um, is um, put in the material exactly as they give it. Copy that out and do a Google search on it. Because sometimes you can identify the secondary source that way. There was somebody that referred at one point in a Twitter thing and they were talk, talking about uh, Dembski Wells. They confused it as though Dembski and Wells were one person, like a hyphenated name. <laughs> But in fact, no, it was Dembski and Wells. And I tracked because of the particular material that they were uh, uh, lobbying uh, down to a particular posting at Evolution News that they were clearly copying from. Oh, uh, ain't it great? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, and that can help you identify stuff. I was just doing a thing before the show started and it, somebody even in the feed was doing source methods. Where did you get this from? You know, can you give us a source on that? And, and they were relatively slow. Finally, they pulled it out and it's from a secondary critic, uh, this uh, um, Neil guy uh, who had criticized this little paper. Well, did they look at the original material? Had they seen follow-up on it? No. Um, nah. No. And so- uh, um, it, it, It's like, it, it, once again, I'm referencing uh, the show from yesterday. Um, can't like the claim that a high rack Ethereum was a high rack. Oh yeah. So Dapper did something brilliant, which is bring up a skeleton of both. Ken yeah. obviously has never looked at the skeleton of a high Well, that, that's another one that's revealing because that's an older creationist trope. That's stuff that comes from the Dwayne Gish era. And you'll find bits and pieces of creationist apologetics that repeat that Hyrax bit. And up lower echelon copyists who are copying that older creationism. So the very fact that you will not find that argument being promoted in the more recent apologetics, and you won't find it at all pretty much over an intelligent design. So the, the, the tropes people use uh, um, can help reveal where they're getting their material from. Just as everybody knows probably that if somebody starts talking about the six forms of evolution, you're going, Hovind alert, Hovind alert. <laughs> well, Hovind. one person actually made a comment to basically sort of as a challenge asking evolution deniers to define evolution without including the six levels of evolution yeah bullshit well and and those are definitional terms i'll, I'll give you this that evolution uh, uh, definitional approaches to argument is less productive because an awful lot of creationists can give you the definition they'll say, well, it's a change in allele frequency. And if they, especially if they're familiar with current apologetics, they have no problem doing that. Um, and many creationists will have no problem accepting in principle speciation, which is not the way most grassroots creationists will approach it. So you gotta be very wary about that definitional frame. What source methods involved is going below the basement that move past the definition to how you use it. What data are you applying it to? What model are you constructing to account for the data? That's very different from uh, a definitional approach. So uh, you know, uh, in the book, um, I allude to the fact, Jackson and I allude to the fact that you've got the three levels of uh, discourse. You have that philosophical superstructure, then um, primary assumptions, materialism, and all that stuff, that's philosophical. Then you've got the big data floor, which most creationists are unfamiliar with. And below that, you have that source methods analytical floor of who do you rely on? Do you fact check? How accurate do you construct argument? Don't forget that basement level. And uh, if you do that, then what you do as you try to see, show that they have no model 
that they don't really fact check their material, that they really are terrible at that level, then you start deploying tactically those data floor issues that help illustrate why your model of evolution explains it and makes sense and why theirs doesn't because they don't even have a model. And that's why evolution slam dunk was done to, to give you all that superstructure of the reptile mammal transition, which you will be able to know exactly what stuff they know and what they don't. Have, have, have TD and, and Tornado, have either one of you deployed the reptile mammal transition in, a, in an online discussion? Oh, no. I, I've, a, I've asked people to um, account for it, like say uh, with uh, Erica's debate uh, with uh, Bill, what's his name? And, and, and how many of them offer a, a source for their argument? Oh, man. I couldn't tell you because I don't think any have. Any did. <laughs> Once in a while, and, and here's, here's the secret game, and it's so secret I'm telling everybody on YouTube <laughs> that so, when you... <clears throat> yeah, as Tornado? Far, as far as the challenge, GCM Gome actually pointed, or GCM Gomi, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I messed up your name. He says, I can shoot, it's like, I can shoot down that claim, this is to a moment of faith, that you have a thorough knowledge of under evolution while well, I do not. I can shoot down that notion with one very simple challenge, and GCM Gomi provides the challenge. Define the scientific theory of evolution properly. That's it. A simple definition accepted by mainstream science with nothing that is not enveloped by evolution added to it and without attempts at word games or sem semantics. Hmm. Well, the one I use is natural branching common descent. Next question. Well, the, I actually used one that was a conglomeration of both the standard descent with inherent genetic modification and the brought and the more specific version that R and Raw uses. So it's kind of a, I basically say, I can do that easily though. It's kind of a conglomeration. The theory of evolution is the theory about how life diversifies, namely a theory of biodiversity through descent with inherent genetic modification due to changes in allele frequencies and reproductive populations over many generations. You realize their eyes will have glazed over by then. <laughs> yeah, and, and all of the, and those both are correct completely. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different approaches to it. Ultimately, the thing is that you have data and you're accounting for that data. And what I did with Slam Dunk is uh, work through everybody that I could find anywhere in the literature, both print and online, that have related to the reptile mammal transition from an anti-evolution perspective. And it's, it turns out there's only about 20 people. And the vast majority, of the stuff in intelligent design and uh, is uh, in book form, not online. The very few online examples, you've got one article by uh, Dwayne Gish from 1981, not his 1995 book where he goes into the really big detail and that's not good, but he at least got a little bit more. And then reprised a lot of stuff that was in the 81 one. Then you've got the John Woodmer app thing, which I have that whole chapter on dismantling that. And then you have a, a Krieger and a few other little hangers on, Mitchell and a few others down the line. Well, that means that since that's it, and I think there's just Nephilim uh, had put up one little posting where he basically repeated a lot of the same shtick since my book came out. So that I would be adding that into a second edition if I get around to that at some stage. But the point is, is that the odds are if somebody is, is angling to provide online criticism of the reptile mammal transition from a creationist perspective, it's most probable they're going to try to throw the Woodmer app article at you from Answers in Genesis. And that means that you will know everything you need to know to counteract that if they make that mistake. So that's the whole point why we uh, um, try to use the material that we do. And when we put together this new Rocks book, we're trying to construct it in such a way that you'll be up to speed on the players. That it's not only the stuff that you're gonna be finding at the upper echelon creationists, but also the stuff you're likely to bump into online and these little tropes that percolate through the thing that, that are in a side issue that people are dealing with. So you know, there's gonna be people who will try to tell you that they found the evidence for uh, uh, the uh, chariot wheels of Exodus in the Red Sea and that is a trope that occurs in a little teeny niche market, Ron Wyatt of uh, young earth creationism that pops up once in a while. And so what we wanna do in the second volume as well as in the first is to, is to create a, a, a really useful frame to where it's gonna be very hard for creationists to be able to get ahead of you because you'll be ahead of them on too many issues. That's what the, the goal of it is. And, and uh, it's fun to do, 
because you learn so much to do it. Jackson um, and I are uh, just feed <clears throat> off of each other with a vengeance in terms of that. Go ahead, Tornado. Sorry, I was just coughing, but also oh, GCM Gomi says after that comment that I made that I, what I said would get me a passing grade on any biology exam. And he co says, quote, you have the two main aspects of evolution covered in that you have mentioned that it deals exclusively with living organisms by implication and that there must be something to descend from. The reason I continually bring it up as a challenge to evolution deniers is simply because I have yet to meet one who can define the very topic they are arguing against. Oh, and, and that's true of a lot of them. Many of them will screw up on that. Although uh, I haven't yet told him I'm actually a Christian. Yeah, the, uh, and I make a big point out of it. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a believer. But I, I do not want this made into a damned atheism issue, that it is not a, a debate between God and atheism. It is about science data and empirical knowledge, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with that. There are people in the scientific community. Robert Broom uh, was a, a believer. Uh, you find Robert Backer today. He's a Lutheran minister. You find lots of people who are, are uh, scientists, who are firmly evolutionists, uh, Francis Collins and others, that it, this, is, this is not an atheism issue. But in the Answers in Genesis creationist worldview, it becomes their correct view of of their version of Christianity and theirs alone, and then the nasty evil atheists who are the countervailing, and so it's dogs and cats living together or the happy sweet world of things. And, and that's a false dichotomy and I won't let them do it and nobody should let them do it. Don't let them slip that little thing under the, uh, the ballpark. Uh, not only, so not only do we have a problem with goalpost moving, but they're trying to put the goalpost on the wrong field, the one that they forgot to bring the ball to. And therein, that's part of our situation on there. So uh, Sean says, I heard those chariot wheels were actually a coral that grows in a round pattern everywhere is found. I'm not sure about that part. There's some, there, 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 the Red Sea has a lot of ship traffic. So bits and pieces of things, even including ship wheelhouse yeah, wheels. Um, the, re uh, the Red show Sea up saw that. all of the spice traffic from Africa and yeah. India that went to Egypt. And, and a, a thing it. that should be borne out about Wyatt uh, Ron Wyatt, I'll type his name in there and you, everybody can go Google uh, that. He, his wife is still um, uh, pushing him and there, there's a little website and there's a bunch of people that follow him in the creationist community. But the problem is, is that an awful lot of people in the Christian community regard him as a pseudoscience git. And even some creationists don't like it, uh, don't like him. And so that, you, that if all you do, and many creationists are parasitical in this way, they encounter the little website that says what they want to be true and it never dawns on them to find out, even with people on their own side, do they accept this thing? That's what makes Kent Hovind groupies so hilarious. They have no clue how disreputable Kent Hovind is in the regular creationist community. They don't, they don't pay any attention to it. It's like Kent Hovind is shunned by his own followers. He's regarded as, as heretical on his theology. Good heavens, Sarfati and others, they dumped on him in terms of his exegesis. So, you know, how, how bad surprised. do you have to be to, to get on the bad side of Jonathan Sarfati? And then again, the then again, creations are really bad with theology. They, yeah, are, the, they are fantastically bad. Never mind the fact that they're not just bad at theology, they're bad at looking in a mirror. Yeah, well, and the same thing goes, and to show you how this has political uh, connections, um, that uh, Tony Perkins who is uh, one of the people who's constantly in the network that supports our current president of the United States. He is a Ken Ham guy who has called Ken Ham a great Bible scholar and his creation museum, a wonderful science museum and all the rest. And so that filtration network of dumb insulating back and forth leads to people who can't quite figure out until it's way too late that we should like have tests for COVID. Things have consequences. Ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences. Bad method has bad consequences. And the gospel of source methods is, don't take my word for it. Check it out. Read widely. Source check the documentation. Convince you that you, the model you prefer actually deals with the majority of the data in a way that is superior to the opponent. And if you can't 
answer basic questions, if you can't conceptualize issues, can't work out what transitional forms would be, you can't quite figure out whether speciation happens and what happens if it does, uh, you have no business jumping into this area. You're way behind the data yeah. curve. It, it, it's like your ice, your uh, bit on uh, isochrons in rocks are there. Yeah. If you have issues with that, check the sources. Yeah. How do you, how did you like that section? Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I was quite pleased because neither neither um, Jackson and I are geologists, but Steve Bauman is a geologist published geologist and he vetted our chapters on that and I can tell you there were no mistakes in it the most he did was say this is an interesting little side issue you might want to bring up or you might want to rephrase this term slightly differently and that was literally the extent of his criticism yeah that that's 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 editing which is good. we, we that's are we good. are not infallible but we're damn careful <laughs> that's probably better than textbooks uh, well, one advance, one thing I can say compared to a textbook, first of all, that there's not that weird political process of uh, taffy pull as to what terms and things they do, which tends to dumb it down a bit. And the other fact is that some of the textbooks then are also a little behind the curve on the cutting edge data, whereas we don't have that disadvantage. We were literally slipping in some technical citations into the book that was ju had just come out like December 2019. I mean, th th so it's it's a, a thing where we tried to be right up to the time when we're dumping the file over to Amazon, boom, very last minute, adding relevant material in there to make it as up to date as possible. I mean, we got the technology, let's use it, damn it. Oh yeah, definitely. Te textbooks yeah. are always a bit behind when they come out. Uh, personally, yeah. I think we should probably be replacing them like every five-ish years. But we'd probably have yeah, to be doing fact, textbooks that's probably at national level. At that the point. idea of having an interactive, constantly updated science field for educational purposes is what we're eventually going to have to go to. And it, it the, the, uh, provided we can oh, keep sorry. privacy issues and all these other factors going on, but we're we're in a a, a, a staggering open door of soup stifle the human imagination and progress. And I, for one, want the immune imagination and progress thing to go on. And so we want to uh, foment a system that will do that, not the one that shackles us in break. Uh, if anyone saw Neil Ferguson's thing on PBS last night or catch it on reruns, or if it's available online for streaming, check it there. The thing on the, the internet and the surveillance state and all, there was a multi-part show that he did last uh, night. It was superb and everyone should see it. Yeah. Yeah. The so there uncomfortable things about the digital age yeah, it, uh, well, the, the, the ability, there was a, a creepy um, bit that he did about uh, 1984 and how we're now living in that. But one of the things, in, if you're familiar with 1984, George Orwell, it was a world in which a totalitarian state that was basically the Soviet Union on killer steroids uh, ran the world and all the world was run by governments like that. And they had view screens in people's houses that were two-way television sets. And you could never quite tell when Big Brother was watching you or not. A whole police state of surveillance was there. And one of the things you could do is if you were giving the impression by your attitude that you were not being properly supportive of the state, that could be what was called a face crime. You were seen to be not right. And isn't that exactly the circumstance of what the Chinese are now doing or where they have little things where if you're, you're behaving in the wrong way, they're putting little chip marks in there, you can't buy a ticket on the high speed train. Millions oh, yeah. of people have literally had their lives altered because they're not meeting the criteria of the super nanny state. It, it, never mind one of the, the fact reasons that why I consider the CCP your lives to have to have, be, have a limited lifespan. It, never mind the fact that these people already have had their lives altered by something that they can't even see. Yeah, yeah, and so we we're, we live in a world now where uh, when I was talking with that lady to kind of pull it around to where we started the show um, about um, my my own mother lived through the 1918 flu pandemic, and she and as did hers. She had relatives that were, had gone through this, this woman I was talking to. So the idea that the previous pandemic of 100 years ago is just off the map somewhere. No, I remember my mother telling me about the experience that she had in 1919 about it. So there was an experience there. Anybody who has kept up with the science literature, 
will know that for years, epidemiologists have been in a kind of <laughs> mode because they know how quickly mutant viruses can transmit in our fast jet age. And that's exactly what we're seeing with the COVID virus. And that something that has a relatively mild vector where it doesn't cause you to suddenly show symptoms way, and maybe most of the people won't even show symptoms. So the little virus can be spreading willy nilly without you knowing it until you suddenly run out of respirators and ICU units. It's like yeah, it's, uh... plague ink. Have, oh, have you, very. Have anyone have ever heard of Plague Inc. Evolved? In, it's a really, well, it's hyper realistic. Let's put it that way. It's a hyper realistic simulation of sorts. It's not completely accurate, but it does what it can. And it's actually been used by the CDC to study how plagues, like oh, yeah, Ma, pandemics, I, like this can evolve. Why why it was so absolutely critical that we have testing, much more importantly than putting up travel bans, is that you need to know who has been exposed and where they are. And that means proactive operations going on, but we kind of missed that boat to where by the time they we started testing, now there's all sorts of places all over the place uh, where the thing is spreading right and left. So yeah, we've got three cases in my home county. Yeah. yeah, I think there's very few places in the United States that don't have some. We have now cases in Spokane where we didn't just a week ago. And uh, uh, it's, it's grinding everybody to a halt. We know how fragile the whole economic system can be. And if it's a situation where not one little country is doing this, but most of the planet is suddenly grinding to a halt, uh, that ripples a gigantic. It's like, just think of a traffic jam on a freeway, except with whole governments and peoples and... Uh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's nasty. The traffic the jam college it. fund has uh, lost a lot of money. It's yeah. nasty. So well, it, this is going to be showing the application of macroeconomics as to how you deal with a crisis like this, what you do to get money into people's hands to tide them over while they're out of work. Uh, because you, you literally can't, it's not people who are out of work because the demand is slowing down just because of other factors. It's because it's unhealthy for them if they work. And so they can't. So suddenly that whole network of economics in, a, in an economy that's based on consumer. The, the consumer this, drives most of the economy. And you and the that. This is when the government needs shit. to... This is when yeah. the government needs to do emergency economic reallocation to give people money while they can't work because yeah. all They're, the jobs are shutting down. Uh, oh, by the way, if you don't watch or listen to uh, Marketplace on NPR, change that because they keep up with the market elements. Kai Rizdahl is a superb host. They're fair and methodical. You can get them on streaming things on your smartphone. There's a bunch of different venues you can deal with that on that. And I can tell you, I never miss that show because they'll give you the true skivvy on things. And they're talking about not only the economics, but the <clears throat> impact of it uh, in health fields and a lot of other stuff. And they talk to the experts. He's got his feet on the ground all the time, connecting up with people who work in, in particular target industries that he calls them on the phone and find out what they've been doing and, and malls that have had uh, loss of uh, uh, usage over the past few years and what happens with them. It's just superb show. So Marketplace, um, make a point of that. I'll type that into the live feed in here. Uh, check that out on NPR. Do, 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 do. And if you can follow them on Twitter. Uh, there's various social media where you can locate all of that. So we can make use of this time while we're locked in our houses, scared shitless to go out uh, to uh, upgrade the kinds of interconnections we do. And anybody that bumps into stupid and people spreading claptrap like Nunes has been doing to say, oh, no, no, go and then keep it doing the way things is normal. Um, everybody can use their venues. I do that on Twitter. Anybody else that's on these social media uh, stand up for the things that are true and offer the evidence and seek out primary source material that's the case and work fight back against the wooist because this time it's going to kill us if we don't oh, yeah Mary. because here's the thing that i've been saying yesterday donald trump at until up until recently donald trump was you know sort of upsetting stupid as in he was stupid but he wasn't stupid enough to actually kill people. 
Now we've moved into another realm. The, the coronavirus does not give a rat's ass about non-disclosure agreements or lawsuits or mm -hmm. what anybody says on Fox Trump Pravda. It won't make a diddly squat difference. And the fact of the matter is that the policies that Donald Trump initiated by cutting the CDC pandemic team, because it was an Obama program, so we don't need that, mm -hmm. back in 2018, uh, and they've even got his self-serving remarks on the subject at the time that he was cutting it, why he didn't think that made much sense. And then when the first news was coming out about this, slow on the uptake to take it seriously. He slow even called on the it a hoax. To get testing. This, this will cause more people to die than would have had we done preparedness. Trump, th this isn't just a matter of Trump being stupid. We know he's monumentally stupid, but this time his stupidity is actively killing people. Yeah. He's got blood on his hands this it's time. It's like anti-vax. Yeah, um, and he has the gall to say that it should be the states that are dealing with it. Most of the states don't put money into the government. Most well, the, fa money. the fact of the matter is our governor here, uh, Inslee, who, by the way, Trump called a snake, um, uh, uh, has been very proactive. And it isn't even political. There are Republican governors who are smart on the ball on this and are listening to the scientists. And so basically, it's a matter when when the, when the president gets on and does his little self-serving things and White Walker Pence gets up there and does his little things, I say, listen, nice of you to get on board donnie come lately but the fact is we're going to get through this and it's going to be in spite of you not because of you stand back and let us do our job let's just say yeah. there's not going to be a sing i don't think there's going to be a single person voting for trump after this oh, well, oh no, there no, will no, be the, the, there will the, be the creationists and the demographic that he has, there's a, there's a set of demographics that are impervious. I interact with them all the time. Maya brings up a very good point here. Everyone keeps forgetting about the Kurds. Yes, don't forget for a moment that Donald Trump, nobody else, betrayed the Kurds in a shameless, stupid act of cowardice and, and nincompoopery that we're going to be picking up the pieces of that gigantic mistake for the next 20 years. So anyway, that was ending on a really happy note. Uh, yeah, we, we lost about our, we lost our stabilize, the stabilizer um, in that, the least. Thank you all uh, yeah. for uh, the, the show. It's it's We're in tough, nervous times, uh, but nonetheless, we will see it through because science is our defense mechanism and reason and fairness. And I, on a, at a grassroots level to the people I'm interacting with at the grocery store, these are decent, wonderful people, independent of their politics. And we Americans are going to go through this, despite what the orange blowhard may or may not say in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So scientist Mel, thank you for hosting again. Before and, we end the show, I oh, kind of yes. want to do a direct address to the people out there who are watching, anyone who doesn't watch, anyone who's listening. I'm going to do a John Oliver here. Okay. Good evening, my fellow introverts. This may be the moment you've spent your whole lives training for. This may be the moment that you all have unwittingly been practicing for. Like, let me put it this way. You guys have been out there turning on your gaming PCs and Xboxes, just sitting back, living your sedentary lifestyles without any thought of what it could possibly do for the public, for hell for the country but at this point you don't need to ask what you can do for your country because you already have the answer keep doing what you're doing right now sit on your couch do all your gaming stay home but let me put it like this like ralph macchio you've been honing your skills waxing cars and painting fences well as john oliver said now it's time to do some fucking karate <laughs> and that's you all that, need that to we, we're in a pivotal moment in the history of the world and the republic as we're moving into an era of a new way of thinking of stuff and it's us you me everybody we're the ones that make the future we're the ones that can break the future nobody else and it's up to us to do the right thing and to stand up for what is right and not be cowardly about it and together we'll make it you guys who are gamers who are could best be described as couch potatoes, this is not an insult to you. 
This is actually actively encouraging you to stay home, sit on your couch, turn on your gaming PCs and Xboxes. One of the programs you can run right now is Folding at Home, which is dedicating most of its processing time right now to research on COVID-19 to work on possible therapies yeah. and even vaccines. So in other well, we'll words- keep, We'll keep everybody, and, and scientist Mel, I'm sure is doing the same thing on her various postings that everybody is keeping everybody posted on stuff. I see on social media, a huge amount of public service information that's being put out all the time on this stuff, on local news and elsewhere. So we're gonna make it through. We need you to channel that couch potato lifestyle. <laughs> that tons of kilowatt hours that you normally direct towards screaming at other people at Call of Duty or commenting on videos down in... Maybe various... it actually means something useful and helpful. You could actually do things that are useful and helpful in this world. You guys are the front line of defense against the pandemic of the 21st century. We Channel are the future. That... Focus that sedentary lifestyle in a useful direction turn on your gaming pcs and stand at arms the front line defense against covid19 is you you guys could make or break the future of mankind yeah and i and i want i for one am kind of selfish i want the future to go on so see you all next week folks Scientists, uh, you may uh, uh, cut the feed there. And thank you very much for hosting. See you all next week. Um, I'm planning on being here, gang. Happy to be here. Good night, guys. Oh, great. Good night, scientists now. Night. Yeah, I had to get that on because it's relevant. It is. Uh, I, I'm Easily enough. With all the people that I'm bumping into, that, and I'm encouraged.